adults, you can turn to Acts chapter 14 if you're able to. Uh, I am uh, going to be talking a little bit as we get started here. I, I kept moving, uh, like moving things around uh, here in the sermon. I think all the pieces were there, and I just kept rearranging it to get it to make the most sense. And I had to figure out, what do I need to talk about first to make sure you understand what I'm talking about? And then uh, it'll allow us to dig into the passage. Uh, So saying that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about worldviews. Like, what is a worldview? And it's pretty simple. It's how you view the world. All right? And the difference is, you think that the way that you see the world is the way that everybody sees the world. Doesn't everybody see the world the same way? Well, no, it doesn't. I think there's plenty of examples, even just what we're going through right here, right now, uh, I, I can just watch the Facebook feeds when we get, you know, this news that we need to wear masks everywhere we go. And there are some people that look at the same, you know, we're all looking at the same numbers, you know, all the same. Some people look at those numbers and say, oh man, are you kidding me? Like this, these deaths are not anywhere. When you just look at deaths, it's not different than anything else in this area. When you compare it to, you know, the amount of deaths with suicide rate increases, Correct. Other people look at it like, man, we have not had an infectious disease this bad since 1918. This is the largest amount of deaths because of a singular disease since blah, blah. Correct? Uh, you know, and so we can, depending on how we view even the data, can affect the way we interpret that data. Now, worldview is much bigger than that. Worldview comes with kind of some of the most fundamental questions, like who is God? All right, what am I? You know, what is a human being? Is a human being just some sort of evolved ape? Or is a human being a special, specific, unique creation of God? It it comes to things like, what is the purpose of life? Is the purpose of life simply to just, you know, procreate and leave this world better than we came? Or is the purpose of this life to honor God and to glorify Him? As we begin to question these kind of big, giant questions, like, what is God? What is my purpose? Is there an afterlife? This is what forms the foundation of the way we view the world, and we filter everything through this. Now, I'm going to give you three examples of what we deal here commonly in America. Common worldviews of of your neighbors, common worldviews of people in your own family, common worldviews of people you work with. This is not uh, uh, where I start out. Just I just want to show the difference even with our neighbors, and then we're going to be able to look at some examples later on of, you know, yeah, when you're talking about people who live in tribes and the other side of the world, we're talking about the audience of Paul, you know, people believing in the Greek pantheon. All right, these, the way they viewed the world is so, so different. They might look at an event and see something very, very different. But again, to start with an idea of what a worldview is, of what your neighbor might be dealing with, I think a very common, pervasive worldview that we deal with here in America is what I label the New Age worldview. The New Age worldview uh, might be what you would think of someone like Oprah kind of saying, you know, uh, in in one of her television programs or radio shows or magazines, um, it, the, the New Age worldview holds the idea that I determine what is true. I determine what is true. We hear this all the time, like, well, well that's true for you, but that's not necessarily true for me. Or I'm glad that works for you, that hasn't worked for me. All right, because I'm the one that determines what is true or not. We, we say things like, well, what I think the Bible is saying there is, dot, 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 or I don't think God would do that. I don't think that's what God thinks about what this is the idea that i am determining what is right and wrong i determine what is truthful and not all right and and this is very very common it's a in in its history it's a mixing of kind of the eastern pantheistic worldview the kind of the eastern worldview with a western worldview when you mix those together you get this new age worldview and it's, it's, it's very me-centric. And that fits in really well with our Western consumer mindset. And so the, the me, I determine I'm the captain of my fate. 
I'm the master of my soul, and this is a New Age worldview. Now, what we have in general, the broad term for what we believe as Christians, what we call a theistic worldview. This is still very common. You're going to know people in life that have a theistic worldview. All right? And, and they, they have the idea that God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. If, if you ever grew up like in the Navigators, things like that, the four spiritual laws, all right? and I've seen these little tracks around the four spiritual laws, that's the first spiritual law, that God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. All right, this is vague. I mean, this would be true of a Jewish person. This would be true of a Muslim person. Uh, this is a broad topic. So, but when we meet people that believe that God is real and that God has a plan for your life, this is a theistic worldview. All right, now, hopefully, at least you can see how none of these are, you know, monoliths. They, they all interact with each other a little bit. There are those that have a lot of New Age influence to that, that start, you know, start mixing in what I want to be true. But the real theistic worldview should have more of an idea of, well, how does God see things? We call this the Christian worldview. Like, how does God view it? What does God say is right and wrong? What does God say what I should do? And we are looking, for us specifically as Christians, the Bible. What does the Bible say is the answer here? Obviously, a Muslim might say something like, what does the Quran say is the answer here. All right? But the theistic worldview believes that there's a God and that that God is involved in our life. All right? And this is a very common viewpoint of people here in America. Now, I want to share one other one, also something you would suspect, is what is labeled as the naturalistic worldview. All right? This is the idea that only nature exists. So as a Christian and theist, a theist, we would say, that God is real, the spiritual world is real, and the physical world is real. And we call those equally real. That God is as real as the physical world. Like, I know I can feel this desk, but I also believe that, you know, God and angels in heaven are equally as real as this desk. They're just in the spiritual world. All right, the naturalist rejects that. They say the only thing that is real is the natural world. The only thing that exists is the physical world. And unless I can touch it and feel it and measure it, it's not real. They would hold to something like nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's going to die. All right? A very, maybe that's a little nihilistic, but the idea that there's not like a purpose of life. There's not a purpose of the universe. Like there's not a why does this universe exist? It just does. Why do you exist? You just do. You know, like, there isn't reason behind any of this. It just is. And there's certainly a lot of atheists. The, the, the largest growing worldview in, uh, the, excuse me, the fastest growing worldview in America is what we call the nons. They're non-religious, they're non-believers, they're, they're nons. They're, what, what was once, you know, like 3% of the population when I was a kid moved to about 9%, which is now about 16%. All right, now not all of them are like pure atheists, all right, but we're, we're seeing that idea of just disassociation from any kind of religion, a disassociation from any kind of systemic belief system, obviously that creates a lot of atheists in the wake. But the reason why I brought New Age first, New Age, uh, the New Age worldview up first, is that I think it's the most prevalent worldview in America today. And even self-attesting Christians have let a lot of that thinking infect them. And we, we argue over personal preference. We argue over emotional impact. We say things like, well, I believe this and I believe that. And it's disconnected from what the Bible has to say, which is a term I like to use is a biblical worldview. All right, that we, when we argue what we prefer and what we think about God, and we're not associating that with Scripture, we really, it's just buying into that New Age mindset that I determine what is right. If I hear something in the Bible I don't like, I have to then reword it and fix it around and change it around so that it becomes more palatable for me. That's New Age worldview. We aren't allowed to do that. Because if I begin to think that, well, my thoughts 
are equally as valid as the thoughts of the Reformers and the Church Fathers and the New Testament writers themselves. When my, my view on things is equal to that of Paul's, all right, we can then start veering off into any direction that we want. All right, we say a lot of things like, well, I think God views gay people like dot, 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 or I think God views divorce like, or I think God views pornography like, and what follows is a huge coincidence that what I believe is the same thing that God believes. Fantastic. All right, we, we look at that as coincidence, that we think God views it this way, but we're really just saying, this is how I think. This is how I want to think about it. And we're not actually fighting for understanding what God means by what he says in Scripture and allowing our viewpoint to begin to coincide with his. All right, the way we view the world is more individualistic. Okay, this is just a very common American way. Of, we, we are individualistic, all right, meaning that I only filter things through my point of view. I, I internalize it. We are internalistic. Internalistic is how does it make me feel, okay? I view everything that happens to how it makes me feel, like how I see it, how it makes me feel, and materialistic. All right, that my worth is based on obtaining what I want. Now, we usually think of materialistic as people that want a big giant house or really nice cars. All right, but there's a lot of people that, that there's all sorts of things. There. Some people want a lot of friends. Some people want a lot of likes on Instagram. Like, whatever it is that you want, we want more of it. And when we want more of something, that's materialistic. And so, naturally, the way we view the world from our point of view, individualistic, internalistic and materialistic all right now i bring all this up to say is that the worldview in america today is very different than the worldview even just 50 years ago in america all right it's changed a lot it's changed a lot and depending on how you grew up it can seem even different even just in the last few years all right but when paul was heading out into the gentile world all right it is such a different viewpoint than the way we were even just reading in a few verses earlier when he's in a synagogue in Antioch. It's certainly different than when Peter was preaching at uh, Pentecost there to a Jewish audience there in Jerusalem. All right? the, the Gentile world's point of view is so different. It, it might seem like America's changed a lot in the last 50 years and that we view things really differently. And it can even feel like, even just in a few years, it's different. But it is not compared to how drastically different the world was that Paul was entering into here in Acts chapter 14. It began in chapter 13, we're in chapter 14 now. It is so different. And we're going to see one example here of what happens when two competing worldviews collide. And how an event that can happen that we would interpret perfectly normally we see how someone else can interpret the event so differently than the way we interpret it we can then see how paul responds to that clash in worldview and then hopefully that can help us do the same and i'll show how our worldviews collide when we talk to even the world today so i had to preface that a little bit but let's get into acts 14 hopefully it starts making more sense to you in one second acts chapter 14 starting in verse 8. I'll break it down a little piece by piece. 14.8, at Lystra, okay? So we're, we're talking that he's in, you know, Asia Minor here. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him, had seen that he had faith to be made well and said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. All right, this, this seems very similar to miracles that Jesus performed. We see Jesus, um, you know, healing people who were lame. All right, even the mention of it, it's been like this since birth. We've seen a few examples of someone that didn't like get lame later in life, that they've been lame their entire life. All right, this is also similar to a miracle that we see with uh, Peter 
and John in uh, the temple. We talked about this a few weeks ago. They're walking into the beautiful gate. Here's this lame man. He's been there for like 20 years. He, they don't have any gold or silver, but what they do have is this power from God, and they can say, get up and walk and heal him. So we see the power of Jesus. We see Jesus has clearly given this power to his apostles who are saying the same things, get up and walk. That power has clearly gone to this kind of one of untimely birth, the way that Paul talks about himself. He was not one of Jesus' disciples growing up. All right? He wasn't specifically one of Jesus' disciples, but he has been radically saved. And because he's now been radically saved, we see that he has the same power that has come upon him, that he can heal people with just a word. Stand up to your feet. And this man leaps up, okay? So again, this fits into things that we have read about and things that we have heard about, things that we have seen. Verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. All right, clearly, these people viewed this miracle very differently than the way we viewed it. All right, we saw this miracle as like, yeah, 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 listen, Jesus did miracles to prove he was God. Jesus did miracles to reveal that he has power over nature and power over sickness and power over disease, power over demons. We, we recognize that Jesus is revealing his divinity. We then see as he's given this power to his disciples, as he promised he would do, but when you go to Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power to go be my witnesses. We see Peter and John having the same power. And people there in Jerusalem are saying, these men do what Jesus did. They must clearly be messengers from the Messiah. It made perfect sense. And again, when we read, when we read Paul and Barnabas doing miracles, it's like, yeah, God wants these people to realize that they are truly messengers from the one and only living God, that they have power over nature and sickness and disease and sin and all these things. They have this power over that to reveal that God is really all-powerful and they can believe in him and trust in him. This is how we view it. They viewed it very different. They viewed it as the stories that we've heard of Zeus becoming a man and these stories that we've heard of like, you know, Heracles, which is the Greek name for Hercules. Hercules is the Roman name. The, the, we've heard these stories of Heracles and Perseus, these half-gods, half-men that can do amazing things. We're looking at one right here. And the priest of Zeus, when you go to Greece, uh, when, you went to, when I went to Athens, they're not quite in Athens yet, uh, but when you go to Athens, like there's all these hills, and on every hill there's a different monument to a different god. And so there was, they were probably near the little mount where Zeus's little mountain was, and they had a little statue on there for him or a little, uh, little Parthenon-looking thing for him to hang out in if he ever comes down. And so the priest, so Zeus is like grabbing all his sacrificial material, ready to like make a sacrifice, saying, Great Zeus, thank you. Thank you, Zeus. Thanks for gracing us with your presence. They obviously view the miracle very differently than the way we view it. All right, but when the Apostle Barnabas, this is verse 14, when the Apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes, rushed out in the crowd, crying out and saying, Man, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. There is, like, our nature, who we are, we aren't half God, half men. We're not gods that look like men. All right? We're not gods in a little meat puppet body. We are human, just like you're human. There is nothing biologically different than us. We're spiritually different. But biologically, we are of the same nature as you. All right? And he says, this is what we've been preaching. And we preach the gospel to you, the good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth 
and the sea and all that is in them. All right? And in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own way. And yet he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did, not, he, that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Now, this message here is really specific to the Greek pantheistic believers, uh, the believers in the Greek pantheon, they're not believers, B- uh, believers in the Greek pantheon. This is a really specific message. And, and in a second, I'm going to explain to you the, 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 the worldview of the person that believes in what we call Greek mythology. The person that grew up believing in Zeus and Artemis and Athena, this message that they are giving to them right here, this gospel presentation, is very specific to that particular worldview. We'll break that down in just a minute, but just to conclude this passage that we'll talk about, and even saying these things, with difficulty, they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So the end of this message doesn't end the way that like Acts chapter 2 ends. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter is preaching to the crowd, and he's preaching the gospel to the crowd, we see thousands of people come to Christ. At the end of this message, we see they are still having to fight with this worldview. They still have people that they're like, I don't get it, is this a test? Is he testing us to see if we'll make a sacrifice to him or not? Let's still make a sacrifice just in case. He's like, no, stop it. Like he couldn't, he didn't quite convince them. They still had to work and fight because it was, they still had to wrestle with this worldview. It didn't just switch there in that moment. Again, breaking this story down, it starts with a miracle. A miracle that we completely understand. A miracle that seems very similar to Jesus, the other apostles. We see Paul now has the same miraculous power. Something that we would expect if Paul really is who he says he is. He really is an apostle that God has set aside for the Gentiles to bring the good news to this lost and dying world. We would expect him in this kind of early stage here in Acts to have that kind of power to really prove who he was. And he does. And he does. But Paul has to deal with something that Peter didn't have to deal with. The reason why in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up, or in Acts chapter 7, Stephen stands up, uh, or Peter does another one in Acts chapter 4, the reason why it's so easy for him to stand up, share the gospel, share stories about Moses and Abraham and King David and concludes with, you need to repent, believe in Jesus, where it just seems like, yeah, that seems like a really clear gospel presentation. That's how we would present it. We would present it as, here's who Jesus is. You need to believe that he died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. Turn from what you or your previous life and turn towards Jesus. The reason that it seems so simple to Peter is that the audience of Peter had a judeo-christian worldview okay they had a a biblical worldview the the way that dave excuse me the way that peter thought is the same way that his audience thought that there is a god that he is the creator that they believe that he would send the messiah peter's preaching that jesus did send the messiah and this messiah was jesus and here's the proofs that jesus is the promised Savior that God's been promising all these years. They saw the world the same way. But now we are going to start seeing, beginning here in Acts chapter 14, and for the next few chapters, you're going to see that, that Paul has a difficult challenge. That the way that he thinks about God, the way that he thinks about the world, the way that he thinks about human beings is very different than his audience. It's very different. When his audience hears, or when an audience sees his miracle, their assumption is, this must be Zeus and Hermes. 
If, if, if he was near the water, they would have thought he was Poseidon. You know, like, they, they are filtering it through the way they view the world. Now I'm going to give you an example that I think will hopefully help you understand this a little bit more. Obviously what we've just been dealing with in our family is my wife's aunt passed away uh, very suddenly, unexpectedly. She was not sick, all right? She had no known heart issues. She had no known issues at all. She worked at a hospital, all right? She, in the middle of the night, just died. Heart attack. Next morning, her husband's waking up, can't wake her up, she's dead. I mean, that, that's jarring. That's sad. She's young, 60s. I guess, depending on how old you are, you can decide if 60s is young or old. She was very young. She's very young, very young. All right? Uh, the, she, she was young. You know, not, not that we would expect something like that. Again, not some kind of diagnosis that warns you like any day now. Nothing. Nothing. So how do we view this? All right? With a biblical worldview, The way we view this unexpected act, because first of all, we wonder what happened. All right, but again, we remember, we believe that the physical world is as real as the spiritual world. So we always have questions in the physical world, what happened? Physically, what happened? It's always our question. We always want to know, oh, what happened? Brain aneurysm, heart attack, you know? We're always asking, what's the physical reason for her death? We want to know that. We would never be okay with, like, she just died, like, yeah, we have no idea what happened. Like, are you going to do an autopsy? Like, we we have questions. We want to know. Because we understand there are kind of laws to this physical world, and we have a question about that. We always kind of are intrigued and interested in what happened. But we also said, we also believe the spiritual world is equally real. And so we start asking God, why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why did this happen to her? All right, we always have these questions of why and this questioning of God. Now, no, not, the normal thing is that we don't get an answer from God. We don't get some kind of physical, uh, or we don't get some kind of auditory answer for what God is doing. But again, as much as we might be angry at God for a moment because we know he could have stopped this. All right, that's why there's that normal, that visceral reaction. Why God, why? Because we know God was powerful enough to stop it. But in time, and again, I never, you can't ever fast forward this. You can't ever speed people up in the grief process. But what happens in time with a biblical worldview, you start to come to grips with it, that God's ways are not my ways. God's thoughts are not my thoughts. Uh, I, I long, I, I wish sin and death wasn't in this world. It's not right. It doesn't feel right. And we know that's true because when God created the world he created it perfect but it's because of sin because of the fall of man that sin and death has now entered the world that there's now death is a part of this world because of sin and we long for the days of heaven where god will wipe away every tear from our eye we long for that promise and and i guess secondly eventually we turn towards praising god because she was a christian we praise God that we will get to see her again one day. We praise God that we get to see her because if we're going to go to heaven and she's in heaven, we will be reunited. We do pray for God to comfort the family. We understand the difficulty. Uh, if you've ever gone through anything like that, you, you can at least somewhat imagine the pain of a husband and a child losing someone so close to them. So we pray for God to comfort the family And we recognize that she made an impact on so many people that will affect people's eternity. Uh, And so we can can rest in that uh, a little bit. And I guess the third thing I think of when I think about dealing in this scenario is we'll miss our loved one. We'll miss them. That's normal, right? We miss these little moments, but we, we also think of some good times and we remember times we laughed and smiled together. And we look forward to seeing them again one day. Now, we might keep some little keepsakes, you know. Uh, people deal with grief a little differently, you know. Some people like, I got to get rid of anything that reminds me of this person, I got to get rid of. I can't look at that. Other people are like, no, nope, I got to take a few memories here and there. There's really no right and wrong on that, you know. Everybody kind of deals with death a little bit differently. But we know the world was a better place because they were in it. 
But I hope you recognize that the way that we view death isn't the way that everybody views death. This is not how everyone would view that scenario. Let me bring up a very common worldview in the world, something we call an animistic worldview. So this is what we would think of as like a, a tribal worldview, whether in Africa or in um, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. All right, the animistic worldview, which is a very Eastern mindset. Um, this is again, this is how many people viewed this for thousands of years. This is how people would have viewed this particular event, and it's still again, it still exists. There's still millions of people who have this worldview today. When a loved one suddenly died the question would be twofold. Number one, did somebody hex her? Did somebody put a curse on her? Was there, did she have an enemy that went to some witch doctor and you know, put, you know, put a kind of a curse on her in some way? Or did she cross an evil spirit and didn't know it? Did she do something? Did she chop down the wrong tree? Did she step on the wrong plant? Did she eat the wrong kind of food? Did she forget to celebrate some spirit's day that she should have? And that spirit came for vengeance. If somebody died in the middle of the night like that, they would be wondering, A, did somebody hex them? Or B, did they cross some evil spirit? And that would then be on us to investigate. We would have to then go start figuring out. we go talk to people. We're, we're going to go kind of try to follow the last few days of her life. What did she do? If we find out that she was hexed, our choice is, are we going to go to the witch doctor and put a hex on their family? Or maybe we just get, if I got enough people, maybe I just go and kill them. You know, if I can, if I can just handle that myself, maybe I'll just go and kill them. And, and then they'll just be fatwas back and forth. You know, we'll just be hexing each other as families for generations. Because I'm sure there's some family that's accused our family in the past, and we can go back, it was probably them. If I figure that she just kind of upset a spirit. She picked the wrong apple from the wrong apple tree. All right, if that's my best guess, I'm going to that apple tree, I'm bringing a sacrifice of some sort to pay homage, to say we are sorry, because if that spirit was offended enough to kill my aunt, well, maybe I don't want her to kill anybody else in my family. And so I'll leave an offering for that spirit to take and to show that we are sorry that we took something from them. This is how... Thousands of millions of people over thousands of years have viewed things that everything is spiritual that there's a spiritual battle there's there's good spirits and bad spirits and when something bad happens it's because a bad spirit did something bad to us now when i prepare her body we're going to prepare it in a particular way we're going to bring the witch doctor in all right we're going to make sure we do everything right with the right sages and the right smells and the right everythings all right because we hope her spirit can find the spirit of our ancestors all right so we hope to do everything we can do that can direct her path and if we don't what we worry is that she'll become a spirit that'll haunt us because she died unexpectedly she wasn't prepared she could very easily become a malevolent spirit because eventually, if you're separated from your body long enough, yet you forget who you are. And she could become a malevolent spirit that haunts our family for generations. And, and that we, we want to prevent that. So that's why we get the witch doctor in to help. And you know what? We'll, at the end of the day, we'll probably rid ourselves of everything she had. We'll rid ourselves of all her possessions and burn them because we don't want her to be attached to any of those. We worry that if we hold on to that locket that she had, that her spirit might get attached to that locket, all right? And she might follow us. So we want to get rid of all her earthly possessions and burn them so that they arise up to the heavens where her ancestors are. Again, it's how someone dying in the middle of the night, depending on your worldview, drastically changes that event it drastically changes that event. Maybe something that hits a little closer to home. The atheistic worldview. The atheist would wonder what would happen. And, and if they didn't get enough answers, they might uh, implore more autopsies. I know in this particular case, they didn't want her all cut open and remove all the... Or they didn't want an extensive autopsy. Why? Well, at the end of the day, what's the difference? And so they didn't do an extensive autopsy. They basically just did a quick check. They're like, yeah, it looks like a heart attack. 
and that was enough of an answer. But you can see how the atheists would maybe pay a little extra. But the way they view it, it was a clogged arteries, heart condition. It is what it is. Circle of life. Things die. We get buried. We become soil that helps the grass grow for future animals to eat, etc., etc. We're all just stardust, and the stardust will return. We cry a lot because we'll never see her again. Uh, we question ever having children because 2020 is just the worst. Why would you want to bring children into this night's nightmare hellscape? Some people keep some memories they can hold on to. Some people get rid of everything because they don't want to remember. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everyone's going to die. There's no hope in the atheistic worldview. There's no future in the atheistic worldview. There is no soul. There is no spirit. There is no afterlife. There is nothing. How we can all view the same event and view it so differently, you can see how your worldview affects the way you view something like that. Now to help us understand the Greek, uh, the Greek pantheistic worldview, that will help us understand the message that Paul is giving to the people at Lystra. All right, The Greek pantheistic worldview, how they would view this is that the gods are very fickle. All right? They would call them capricious. All right? This is the idea that, you know what, you never know what a god is thinking. They can do anything, and it might be a bad thing, it might be a good thing, it might be to try to help, it might be to try to hurt, but most of the time they just view the gods as just messing with people. The way when we're kids we burn ants with a, a little magnifying glass, or we flood, you know, flood ants, like we are Poseidon with the flood, just like flooding them, like, let's see if they have little Ant Noah down there. All right? We, you know, what we do to ants is ants. It's like, you know, we would worry if somebody was, like, torturing, like, a cat. But everybody's allowed to torture ants. It doesn't matter. They're ants. All right? So when we do that, that's how they viewed the Greek gods, that they just play around with human lives like it's a chess game. And they just put us in different positions to see what will happen. They have us go to war because they're bored. You know, this God's fighting. And like, okay. And they're fickle. So, loved one dying, it's the fates. The, they have the loom of fates and they decided to cut her thread. And why? Who knows? They do what they want. They're fickle. Maybe it was good, maybe it was bad, but sometimes they just want to watch us cry. They looked at she as a new journey ahead. That there was new, they, they, she, the physical journey has ended, but now there's a spiritual journey. What we'll probably do, we'll take coins and we'll place them on her eyes so that she has money uh, for the boatman to cross the river Styx. We hope she will find a good place to spend her next life. She's got to get across, you start in the bad, you got to get across the bad, and that's why you got to pay your way in there, you got to pay your way across the bad lake, and so that you can enter the good possibilities. And we'll take some of the things and place them with an offering before Athena. We'll take some of her, that locket, and we'll take it and we'll put it at, at the feet of Artemis or at the feet of Aphrodite or at the feet of Zeus or whoever we think might help her. Whoever we think, you know, again, if I lived in Athens, I would pick Athena because Athena likes the Athens because we named our city after her. You know, the Ephesians would have done Artemis, because they viewed her, uh, I guess, uh, they viewed her as the protector of their city. So we, we, are, we are an Ephesian. Please, please take us so to Lystra. Maybe it was Zeus is who they looked at the most. <coughs> but they would place some of her things before Zeus, hoping that maybe in an act of momentary kindness, he might say, all right, here, Go enjoy the summer lands. We can just hope. We have no promise. We have no direction. Just hope. Just hope. So when Paul and Barnabas, uh, when they are confronted and called Zeus and Artemis, and that's Zeus and Artemis there. Artemis is the guy with the fancy shoes on that can fly. Um, oh, not Artemis, uh, Zeus and Hermes. Um, so when he's called Zeus and Hermes, they really have two choices to respond. Number one, they could use it. 
they could say, okay, hey, hey, Barnabas, don't be so hasty. They think we're Zeus. Let's go and say, yes, I am Zeus, and I'm here to tell you, you need to believe in Jesus, or you're going to die and go to hell. All right, let's use it, guys. Hey, let's, let's go with this. Herm- yeah, 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 let's, let's run with this. All right? Yes, I am Hermes, savior of the city. You will listen to everything I have to say. Stop doing all the sinful stuff. Stop doing that. Start reading the Bible. They could use it. Now, there's obviously a lot of problems with that. And I hope none of you would think, like, that's a good idea. I saw Jacob, like, keep going. Tell me how this is bad, because I'm liking it. All right? Uh, they think that we're gods. Like, that could, that could be useful, right? It's a problem. Lots of senses. Number one, it's a lie. All right? Lying is bad. Don't lie. All right? It would only scare people into believing in Jesus. You know, the only threat you can do is or will punish you. And I think a lot of people do just do things for, like, fire insurance. They don't really believe it. They're just like, oh, whoa, i got to say some prayer? Deal. I'll say whatever you want me to say to protect myself. Uh, it brings a lot of baggage with it. Because Christianity isn't compatible with the worldview of the polytheistic Greeks. Jesus isn't a hero like Heracles. He isn't a hero like Perseus or Achilles. He is not a god like Zeus or Poseidon, or Ares, the message of the gospel is built upon the world described in the Bible. And we can't interpret the gospel or the Bible through a different worldview. When we start trying to think like a Hindu person, you just start adding Jesus into a whole line of avatars. All right, Jesus is not in the line. Jesus is not another god like Zeus and Poseidon. You're not adding in, okay, there's a Jesus, sounds good. All right, he's not another one. All right, this is why they are so quick to deny this, because they don't want them to think that the way they view the world of there being lots of gods is the correct one. It's incorrect. So they deny it. All right, and to deny it, but they do make sure they can connect it. And what I mean by that is, no, I'm a man just like you, but what he says after this is very specific to the audience, all right? And this this matters to us. I'll I'll talk about this, but let's look at what he says here. So as he preached the gospel to you, that you should turn from the vain things to a living God. And so what he's saying is, no, don't believe the vain things. Don't believe these fake stories of Zeus and Hermes and Poseidon. No, 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 set that aside. Believe in a living God. Okay, God is not a distant being that is long dead. God is alive. He is real. He is here and ultimately revealing his power through Paul. All right, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So the way that the the Greeks viewed it is that there's a God of the sky, Zeus. There's a God of the water, Poseidon. All right, that there is a God of the beasts, uh, ultimately it would be Aries in their sense that they control all the things in the earth. So he's saying the living God is the God who made the heavens, who made the earth, who made the sea and everything in it. So he is presenting the living God as above and beyond any other gods you've heard of. Your God, what, supposedly rules the sea? My God made the sea. Your God supposedly like rules the air? My God made the air. The living God he is presenting him is above and beyond all those things. In a generation gone, he's permitted all the nations to go their own way. So now he's showing like, well, if if God is real, how come we haven't heard of him? He's telling them why you haven't heard of them. We have allowed people to go any direction that they want to go. You wanted to believe in these fake gods? He let you. You people, I have other people that they wanted to believe in like the sun god like Ra and build pyramids. He let them. So he let you believe whatever it is you wanted to believe. Because again, what's God's choice? God's choice can either be, I'm going to destroy them. Because they are disobedient to me, I'm going to destroy them. We, we look at that and we might say, oh, that's not a bad idea, God. Take all the, the, the evil people out there all the people doing wrong, all the people doing bad, just destroy them, all right? Flood it up. Let's keep doing that. I like that flood thing. 
All right? Keep destroying the world. The problem with that is, if you keep doing that, you guys never show up. And the reason why, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, German pagan traditions. I see a lot of Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, you know, pagan gods and goddesses. If you look into your ancestor, oh, Haroon. Oh, his ancestors were a mess. All right? Every white person, every brown person, every black person, every yellow person, every red person, we all have a history of horrible paganism that rejected God, that turned towards false gods and started worshiping those false gods instead, started building in pagan practices that all had all sorts of sins and evils being passed along as normal with prostitution and death and murder and sacrifices galore. All right? And that is what our history is filled with. We have ancestors not all that long ago, all right, a few hundred years, that were totally, totally pagan. And if God just destroys them all, you don't exist. You don't exist. It is in God's goodness, His graciousness, His patience that He doesn't destroy evil people because the future generation, the children and the children's children and the children's children of those evil people one day were going to repent and believe and come to church this morning. You guys. God loved the world so much that He sent His only begotten Son. And the implications of that is he sent his son to an evil world so that there might be those in that evil world that would eventually come to know Jesus as their Savior. And God saw that as good. And in his love, he wanted to save people who were not yet born. And so here he's preaching to these people. He says, in generations gone by, he's permitted all nations to go their ways. He, he allowed, he doesn't like it. He's not wanting them to do that. He permitted them to continue on in their evil and their ignorance for someone like Paul to finally show up and preach the good news. He's going to get there. And yet he did not leave for himself without a witness and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. This isn't something that God simply said, I'm never going to let anything good happen then. I'm going to close off all the rains. I'm going to shut off all the, the, um, your crops, all your animals. Like Everything's just going to die. You're going to live in destitution. Because when Paul then shows up and says, my God is the one who created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them, they have to view those things as good and fruitful. If they view the, the oceans, everything that touches the ocean dies. The ground, everything we try to plant, the ground dies. What? The birds of the air, everything that flies by kills us. They're all pterodactyls eating us. If everything is bad, how do you come and present God and saying, He is the creator of these good and things that bring you wealth and prosperity. He is the good God that gave a good earth and a good sea and a good sky to provide for you and your families. You, you can't do it. It doesn't work. And so Jesus has brought blessing to people that don't deserve it so that one day they might hear of the true and living God, the creator of the world, and ultimately he's going to share about the savior of the world. But he's giving us a pattern here. He's giving us something. As we deny, uh, as we rightfully would deny that we are not some you know, God come in the flesh, all right, that we are simply a messenger from God. We would do the same thing to a Muslim. What I would say to a Muslim is that there is a true, true that there is one God who is one and all-powerful, who can do anything, and he chose to become a man and to die for the sins of mankind in order to forgive them. I would say to a Buddhist, that there is a reason for our suffering, and that reason for our suffering is sin, and that Jesus came to end our suffering. To the atheist, I would say, there is, nothing, there is never something out of nothing. Life always comes from life. God created this universe. God breathed life into us. 
and there is a spiritual world that is separate from the physical one, and Jesus came to bridge the gap between physical man and spiritual God. What Paul shows us here is that we've got to connect with their worldview, and then we start building a bridge across to understand the biblical worldview. We take the phrasing and the words that they will understand, and then we help them build a bridge to get to the understanding of who God really is. So let's bring some application to this, okay? A lot talked about. I think I can bring it down and actually give you something to walk away with. Number one, and these do go in order. Number one, the first thing that we need to take away from this is we need to bring the gospel and do good. Okay? These are two things that God is revealing to us through the life of Paul, and that he is revealing Paul to be obedient to what God has called him to do. He is out preaching the gospel. That was what he was doing. But while he was preaching the gospel, he saw someone in need and met that need. Okay? I see the church always kind of goes it seems to swing back and forth, and it's not supposed to swing, it's supposed to find a balance. They swing between, well, let's do good humanitarian aid things. Let's feed people and bring medical attention. All right? And then we swing back the other way and say, no, 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 let's all be about sharing the gospel. Let's just fill stadiums and preach the gospel, and that's it. And, and you, there's a purposeful balance. We, our reason for going out should be to share the gospel, but when we see someone in need, we meet that need. So we bring the gospel and we do good, okay? So what are we supposed to do from here? As you go from this place, when you go to work from your homes, <laughs> when you go to work, when you go to uh, the grocery store, when we go to our neighbors, we look for opportunities to share the gospel. That is a reason why God put us in this world is to bring the gospel to people. We share with people about what God is doing in our life. We share with them how Jesus can save them. But if we see someone in need, we're going to meet that need. We're going to do good. The second thing, seek to be understood. Okay? Don't, as you start talking with someone, this can hopefully maybe help you in how you talk to people. You're not talking to people to win the argument. We don't, like, argue people into believing in Jesus. Like, that doesn't work, and I hope you realize that it doesn't work. Like, you can have, like, you can be the smartest and best to know all the answers. You know, the whole people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Like, you can't argue people into believing the gospel. Don't think about trying to win an argument. Think about, and certainly don't think about, i got to get this person saved. I hope you realize, like, God's the one that saves people. You get to share the gospel, God the one who saves. We should seek to be understood. All right? And that comes with asking them a lot of questions. Do you understand what I'm saying about this? Do you understand what I'm saying about that? Seek to be understood. The New Age worldview comes with a lot of misunderstandings of what we're saying. All right? So we've got to be clear. We've got to ask questions. We've got to restate things. All right? Paul and Barnabas showed... It's really easy to get misunderstood by people with a different worldview. They could totally misunderstand what you're saying. If you talk to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, they will mi- the first time you talk to them, they will misunderstand what you're saying. They're going to say this. That's exactly what I believe. No, it's not. It's not. You believe something very different from them. But they've redefined words, and we've got to ask a lot of questions and say, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by sin? What do you mean by God? What do you mean by Jesus? It takes, it takes a relationship. So what our goal is to seek to be understood. Because at the end of the day, if they're like, I understand what you're saying. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. Whew, that's huge. If they can understand what you mean, that's what we fight for. Number three, I guess seems like a little bit of an obvious one, but don't let people worship you. I guess you know, be like, uh, duh, Joe, why did you have to, have to bring this up? I, I think there is, I think it's obvious, but... I do want you to know that people, when you do this, if you share the gospel, take the time to be understood, people will really start to look to you, to rely on you, to learn from you. They can, un, they can accidentally put you on a pedestal that they're essentially worshiping you because they need you. Like, I can't understand this Bible without you. I, I, I can't do this Christian life without you. That's bad. 
That's bad. They, they've made you a god. All right? They, have, they, have, they started to worship you, to rely on you, to trust in you. Everything that we do in discipleship is all about you being able to do this on your own. You can do this. I'm not different than you. I'm not more special than you are. And that last piece of stay vigilant to the truth. Uh, all these things can be very easy to get lax on. All the, it can be very easy to lose the focus of the gospel, either in the desire to share the gospel or in starting to mess up and change the gospel to suit the way the world likes to think about things. And to, I'm going to make the gospel more palatable to this world. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. All right, we've got to stay vigilant. All right, when we look at that last little verse here, that they had to resist. Uh, I like it. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowd from offering sacrifices to them. Like, this is, this is a vigilant task to keep focused on the truth. All right? And when we are trying to stay vigilant to the truth, that comes with the gospel. That's when it comes to doing good in the world. All right? That's when it comes to taking the time to make sure people understand us. That's when it comes to make sure that we don't become a spiritual crutch for people. All right? This is, we've got to be vigilant in our task, and it's difficult. The thing I want to c- comfort you with is, I, I don't know if, it, maybe it's, it, it's really sad, but I, I meant to comfort you. The really sad thing is the world that we live in is closer to the, the, the Gentiles that Paul was preaching to than it is the crowd at Pentecost that Peter was preaching to. Okay? I don't think there's going to be very many instances in your life where you're going to be in a crowd of people that have kind of a Christian worldview and they just don't know Jesus as their Savior and you preach the gospel to them and thousands come to Christ. I think what you're going to see is a lot closer to Paul's ministry. And it's easy to glorify or, you know, to to change the stories of Paul. Paul is incredible. But when you read the end of these stories, two people come to Christ. Three people come to Christ. Zero people come to Christ in this story. Like, the people at Lystra, we don't see anybody that comes to Christ there. They actually end up moving on to the next city. And so people come to Christ in the next city. That's what life is way more like. You are dealing with a pagan culture here in America. They are a mix of new age, individualistic, I determine the truth. The, the answer is, I know when I meet someone, back in the day, he's trying to figure out, like, I wonder if they worship Zeus or if they worship Artemis or they worship Athena. I have an advantage that when I look at people, I know who they worship. They worship themselves. They're the god of their universe. All right, so I know where they're coming from a little bit, all right? And so I've got to engage them like, ah, I've got to get to know this God that they worship. I've got to get to know them enough so that I can share the gospel with them, build a bridge that can help them see how God is truly the ruler of their life, and they need to submit and hand over the authority that they want, the kingship that they want to sit on, the throne that they want to sit on, and they need to give that to God because... Uh, of their life. God is the one on the throne and they're trying to usurp it from him uh, throughout the way they live their life. We are dealing with a culture much more similar to Paul and when we look at Paul's adventures we're going to see a world much more similar to that. When you share the gospel there's going to be many instances that people aren't going to come to Christ. And there are going to be a few instances where maybe one or two, maybe one or two people come to Christ. And that's something to celebrate. But what we see in Paul's life is those one or two that come to Christ start growing. And those one or two turn into four to six, start turning into eight to 16, and before you know it, he's starting to write them and calling them the church at Corinth and the church at Ephesus. Because it doesn't take long for a small group of believers to grow into something that we would really call a church. It just takes a few. And that is the blessing that we see in uh, in Paul's life. Not the thousands of crowds that come to Christ, the crowd where one or two come to Christ because the worldview is so, so different. It's what you're facing. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray as we engage this world, 
as we talk to our neighbors and our friends and our family, and we start seeing, like, man, they, they view the world so differently than me. They view the world so differently than the Bible tells them to view the world. They live their life so differently than the way the Bible tells them to live it. God, let me not lose heart. Let me know that this is a difficult journey. There's going to be a lot of misunderstandings. There's going to be a lot of stumbles along the way. But I want to share the gospel with them. I want to do good and help them wherever I can. I want them, I want them to understand what it is I'm trying to share with them. God, give me the wisdom. God, you need to remove that veil from their eyes for them to have any chance at this. But God, I pray that we can really fight to be understood that they can understand your gospel, they can understand the freedom you offer, they can understand the hope that you offer, God. We love you and we praise you for all you're doing in our life. We, we need your vigilance, God, your patience, your strength to be able to engage this world that you have borne us into. The world is moving faster and farther away from you than I would have ever thought. This world is, does have a, a pagan view of this world. They do not see this world through your eyes in any way, God. God, help us communicate to those around you how they can begin to see things the way they ought to see them. See things through your eyes, through your lens, through your scriptures, God. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. It's what he's calling us to do, and it's what he's calling us to help others to do. Hope you have a great week. Hope to talk to you soon. Email me, call me, text me anytime. I'd love to be praying with you. Uh, we will talk shortly. I will hopefully see you next Sunday. God bless everybody. Luncheon is supposed to be next Sunday. You're right. Uh, luncheon next Sunday. Sound good? <laughs> I will put some things out on Facebook to remind people. So luncheon next Sunday, it is the first Sunday of the month. Thank you. I, I've been gone for a week here. I lose all track of time. We're going to try to stick with first Sunday of the month. So uh, bring anything to share next week, uh, and we will have luncheon uh, next week. I'll put some things out on Facebook to remind everybody. We'll try to get to our care groups and remind everybody. If you're able to join us here, we will eat uh, next Sunday. Uh, and otherwise, you can feel free to join us from home, and we will talk and share and uh, update on where we're at with some things here next Sunday.